interesting specifically in 2007, 2008, having read that book and watch, watching what was happening around the world, it was almost as if it was, like it was a prophecy. straight out of the pages. <laughs> right. And it's still happening. Yeah. Um, you know, Rocket Fuel is, from a scaling standpoint, a phenomenal little book to help you as an entrepreneur make that transition and get to a point of essentially working on your business instead of in it. Mm -hmm. um, the e myth is where that line came from. Yeah. So, my home is filled with hundreds of books. I'd say I've probably read half of them. <laughs> the others, the others are still on the to do list. Right. And are you finding you know, that there's uh, a lot of blogs that maybe are beneficial too as compared to just books, but there's other forms of, of content out there that you can go get? You know, interestingly enough, I think that's the biggest challenge young entrepreneurs have today is they're growing up with Instagram and 15 second story videos and five minute videos on YouTube and Twitter and blog posts. And it's more information than ever mm -hmm. with less value than ever. Mm. And for me, I found that success is in the details. I found that if I will focus on acquiring a piece of knowledge or a skill that I spend a year on mm -hmm. and maybe read five books on or three ring binders on or go to conferences on, and I get down to a level where I'm debating which word I should use out of a document that has 10,000 words because I know that word is going to make a difference, mm -hmm. that's the difference between success and not. And I don't think specifically young entrepreneurs these days really understand that. And so they wonder why they're watching hours of content a day and still not accomplishing anything. So for me, I view it as a, as a negative in many ways, especially if you're just starting out. You're much better served reading a book that's 200, 300 pages long from end to end. Mm -hmm. You're gonna come out of that with a real set of understanding and skills rather than you know a 10-page blog post. Yeah, and I, I, that's what I've noticed is that depth is important and, and it's, it's that extra little few percent of, of knowledge that is the tipping point as yeah. to success versus failure. That's what separates you, you know, as an expert as compared to somebody who's kind of an amateur. Um, success is in the details. Yeah, really yeah. is. So uh, I'm, a, I'm uh, an admirer of self-made man mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of reasons. I think we, yeah, we share some of the common roots in our, our philosophies and what's influenced us. And uh, so just the title caught me when I saw self-made man. I mm -hmm. actually own that, that sculpture. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about it and, and where you're going with it. You know, self-made man was inspired at a Tony Robbins event. Uh, I went to a date with Destiny in 2014. And I was at a transition point in my career in my life where I'd built two successful companies and I needed a new challenge. Um, and I wasn't sure exactly what to do yet, but I, I knew of two problems that I was aware of that I thought I could solve. One was in the uh, food production industry, and this is a bit of a rabbit hole, but I live right across the street from the headquarters of Whole Foods here in Austin, Texas, and shopped in the produce section every day. I do a lot of juicing, and if you, do some juicing at Whole Foods, you're walking out with $60, $70 worth of produce. Yeah. It's not cheap. And it really bothered me that you have to be fairly wealthy in the United States just to buy food that is not covered in poison. Right. And I thought that was really screwed up. So I had an idea to essentially solve that problem. And I wanted to put clean, organic food in everybody's home at a price they could afford. Mm -hmm. So I actually went out and bought a bunch of books on hydroponics on Amazon and uh, started to make notes and come up with ideas on how to solve this and fairly simply put, it had to produce enough food for you and your family on a, a monthly basis that would replace your run to the grocery store. It had to be easy so that everybody could use it. You don't have to have any knowledge of plants and it had to be pretty because it's going to be in your house. Mm -hmm. So I've never developed a physical product, never really grown anything, definitely not dove into tech or hydroponics. So it started on Amazon with a few books and a few phone calls to some industrial design firms and I had a little mock-up made on Photoshop on Odesk. I paid a guy 200 bucks to take this idea and make a little photo of it. And a couple of months later, we signed on with a phenomenal firm in Silicon Valley and we're gonna make the first automated farm for your house that'll grow all of your food. And the idea is how do we decentralize the ag industry? Mm -hmm. 
Because if you get rid of the farm and the farmer and the tractor and the 18 wheelers and the thousand miles of highway or the massive tankers that float from continent to continent, and if you get rid of the pesticides and the distribution centers and finally the retail center, guess what? Your food goes down 90%. You get rid of 100% of the pesticides and the pollution. And everything starts and ends in your, in your kitchen. Uh, but no one had really ever done that before on a consumer level space. Mm -hmm. You can find little countertop systems you can use to grow some basil or mint, but that was about it. Right. So we built it. We built it about two and a half years. We built a system that would grow about four thousand dollars a year worth of food, and for four hundred bucks, right. and fully automated. You just drop in the seed, and the lights take care of everything else, and the nutrients, and the dosing, and the pH balancing, and all of that. And it was phenomenal, but it uh, almost bankrupted me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was a big lesson learned because I funded all of it, and right as we were getting to a point where okay, we've got a prototype working, what do we do next? This was my lesson learned in lack of skill set in this industry. Uh, you know, how much longer is this going to take? Well, probably through safety testing, development, package design, you know, service centers, another two years, another two or three million bucks. It's like, oh, crap. Because when we first started this, you know, the budget was $500,000, at least that was the estimate. Mm -hmm. We were way beyond that at that point. And so I hit a point where I essentially had to go raise money or pull the plug on it. Mm -hmm. And I ended up talking to a mentor of mine, asking him for advice. And he said, look for a win or a way to win in this, even though it might not look like the initial road that you had intended. Mm -hmm. Can you do anything with your competitors? And so I called up a competing company who had just launched a phenomenal line of products that were like ours. They were had a Y Combinator, had a ton of money, mm -hmm. big team, and I ended up investing in them. Mm -hmm. And I pulled the plug on, on Evergrow, which was the company at the time. And the backup plan after that was Self Made Man. Mm -hmm. And the other problem that I took away from Tony's event was the fact that I've seen at least a huge decay in the value system here in the United States mm -hmm. from Washington and Wall Street on down. Now it's get the result you want at any cost, whether you have to lie, cheat, or steal. And there was not a lot of pride being taken in craftsmanship and quality and work ethic. It was just, where's my money? Mm -hmm. And I thought that that was going to lead to a really nasty place here in the U.S. a generation from now. You look at how many young men specifically are growing up without dads and role models. Mm -hmm. Really bad situation. Uh, straight out of the shrugged again. Right. So the backup plan was how can we elicit change on a society level, uh, you know, paradigm essentially over a generation or two. And looking back in history, I've really only found that there's two ways to do that. Mm -hmm. It's through the barrel of a gun, mm -hmm. as many dictators have done, or it's by indoctrinating the kids and the next generation with a different value set. Right. So obviously for me, I went that route. And the goal for Self Made Man is to really provide young men with mentors and leadership and an education set and a philosophy of life that will uh, you know, lead them to become really productive, honest members of society. And that was the goal. And it really took on a life of its own. How long has it been out there now? We launched the podcast in the end of 2014, beginning of 2015. And that's really all it was at the time. I'm going to do a weekly show with amazing people. Mm -hmm. And then this year, 2018, we launched the education platform that we've been building. And essentially, it's an online school mm -hmm. for, for young men with ambition. It's basically the audience that we, we are targeting. Or if you're 18, frankly, to 40, and you have ambition and you want to achieve something more in life, mm -hmm. we want to provide you with the mentorship and the knowledge you need to accomplish that. So, so is the way uh, just go to selfmademan.com and people can mm -hmm. you know, uh, find the podcast and other materials there? Yeah. How rewarding has this been for you? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to be getting just a little message from, from someone who is like, man, you're just listening to the podcast, sent me down a new direction in life, and here's where I was before, and here's where I am today. Yeah. And that's really my goal is, uh, you know, I had, a, I had a pretty vivid dream recently where there was a bunch of pictures of families on the wall that I was looking at, and they were all super happy and stoked and, and feeling uh, just like they're where they were meant to be. 
And those were all of the families whose lives essentially had changed direction because they were exposed to what we're building. And so for me, that, that's you know, what I'm after. So after all these years now that you've put into your entrepreneurial career, um, are you finding growth in your fulfillment? Uh, are you finding that's waning or there's burnout? How are you feeling about it all now? You know, the longer I pursue my career as an entrepreneur, the more I realize I don't know. And Evergrow is a perfect lesson for that, where I like to call I paid a really high stupid tax. <laughs> yeah. You pay the tax, and you're going to pay the tax in one form or another. You're either going to pay it because you're going to go out and buy courses in education and acquire the knowledge you need to pursue what you're building, or you're going to pay it in the form of mistakes, time, and money lost. There's no avoiding it. But one choice is better than the other. Yeah. And so, you know, the more I challenge myself, the, the more lessons I learn, and, and I've still got a hell of a long way to go. So, yeah. <laughs>